you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. When the Bugs Bunny Iron Lady sings it, that makes it official. Welcome to the show, as always. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. We just did our numbers four years into the show, where we changed the format four years ago. We are up in audience numbers over 1,405%. Not 100%, folks. Not 200%. 1,405. And we're proud of it, damn it. And we're not going to quit talking about it because we, we're just proud of ourselves. We did something. Now I'm tired and need a nap, so I'll get to that after the show. We have an amazing multi-book author on the show, as always. In the meantime, though, you must require five people in your downline. The show's like an MLM, but not really. You must, uh, for the show, your family, friends, and relatives, go to goodreads.com, for just Chris Voss, youtube.com, for just Chris Voss, Chris Voss, one on the TikTokity, all those crazy places we're at on the internet. He's a returning guest, the ones we love the most, the ones who return and uh, return our calls after a while. So there you go. Mark Grandy's on the show with us today. He's returning to talk to us about his amazing series, the Gray Man series. If you're not a fan of it, will get a life and order up his book so you can. And, and guess what? He's got a new book out so you can jump right on the bandwagon. His new book is called The Chaos Agent, and it's out February 20th, 2024, here next week uh, coming up. And uh, we're going to be talking to him about his amazing book and what he's been doing in the last year since we've talked to him. Mark Graney is a, has a degree in international relations and political science. It is research for the Gray Man novels, including Agent in Place, Gunmetal, gray back blast dead eye ballistic on target and the gray man he traveled to more than 15 countries and trained along military and law enforcement in the use of firearms battlefield medicine and close range combative tactics he's also the author of the new york times bestsellers tom clancy support and defend tom clancy full force and effect Tom Clancy, Commander-in-Chief, and Tom Clancy, True Faith and Allegiance. With Tom Clancy, he co-authored Locked In, Threat to Vector, and Command Authority. Welcome to the show, Mark. How are you? I'm doing good, Chris. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming back. We really appreciate it. Congratulations on the new hot book coming out. Uh, give us your .coms or any place on the internet you want people to find you. Sure. My name, uh, Mark Graney, G-R-E-A-N-E-Y, books. Dot com is a good place for me, and I'm on all the social media sites, pretty active on them. There you go. So, Mark, give us a 30,000 overview of the new book. This is the 13th Gray Man book, as you said. I hasten to add that everybody is, a, you know, every every single book is a standalone. You don't have to read them in any order. And this one has my hero. His name is, they call him the Gray Man, but his name is Court Gentry. He's a former CIA paramilitary officer. And the book opens with him trying to live a quiet life in Central America. He's being hunted down, so he's trying to lay low. But pretty quickly, he's targeted by this unseen enemy, and he through a little cat and mouse work, realizes that it this, it's the same enemy who is targeting and assassinating the leaders in the fields of robotics and artificial intelligence all around the world. So it's a big globe-trotting spy novel where he has to go and find out what's going on and stop a revolutionary new autonomous weapon from coming online that will completely change warfare. This sounds like one of those things from Godfather 3. They're trying to if I, if I get out and they pull me back in, maybe. Yeah, that that's always the thing. He's <laughs> He doesn't want to be doing this, but uh, he kind of gets roped into things. There you go. But, there you go. You're just trying to live your life and have a few margaritas on the beach, and damn it, they just will not leave you alone But because you got to save the world. Yeah. So uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, your main character, your protagonist. Uh, what is he like, and who is this uh, gray man gentleman? Court Gentry, he started working for the CIA when he was 18 years old. He was in prison 
for some mur murders, but uh, murders that were done for honorable reasons. The CIA had identified him as somebody with a particular set of skills. So they brought him into a training, a two year long training program, and then put him out in the field as a singleton asset, a guy who works alone with, with little, you know, with no net under him and, and little supervision above him. And after a few years, he was pulled into a special activities division paramilitary team. Mm -hmm. And then one day everything went wrong and the CIA targeted him and he had mm -hmm. no idea why. And he became a private contractor, basically a killer for hire. But he only took jobs that he felt were like morally, you know, right for him to do. And so the, you know, 13 books in, we've gone back and forth with his relationship with the CIA. There is kind of a, 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 a decent relationship with mem certain members of the CIA now. And mm -hmm. that comes into play in this book. There you go. It sounds like what I do on Fridays. No, <laughs> I don't do murder for hire on Fridays, people. Don't, don't tell the FBI yet. I'm sure they're probably watching anyway. So give us a little bit of background on you. Let's talk about you and, and uh, how, how did you get into writing? What was some of your upbringing and influences that you had? The, the the background on me is not as interesting as what I just told you about my character is going to be. But no, I, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, where I still live. My dad was the head of the local NBC affiliate. So I just grew up around the news. I had a, a, a love for international relations and the news. So when I was in my early 20 or my late teens, I picked up my first thriller of my entire life, which was a Tom Clancy novel, Patriot Games. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with the genre. And when I was 22, I decided I wanted to try and write a book. And I finished that book when I was 37 and then immediately wrote something else and wrote something else and wrote something else uh, rejected by editors or by agents. Mm -hmm. And it was my fourth novel was The Gray Man, which was the first novel that was published in 2009. And since then, uh, Chaos Agent is my 24th novel. There you go. Congratulations. Did you keep Thanks. all those rejection letters so you can uh, write them every now and then and say, no, 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 no. Yeah. You know, it's like, I know some of the people now who, who rejected me and it's, it's one of those things. It's like, I have other friends who are authors that, that are really that hold a grudge about stuff like that. It, there are, there is a lot of reasons not to publish those earlier books. Okay, I think, well, I think all those people made the right decision, frankly. <laughs> they just needed more time, but you know, they could yeah. have like invested you so you could have developed more, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, yeah. There you go. It's 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 always fun to keep those rejection letters. I have different rejection letters for my businesses from, you know, applying to things. And so it's kind of fun to keep them. And you're just like, yeah, you were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but this is good motivation to to push you to that next level. Yeah. So what's it like? You know, you, you said your first big novel that you picked up that you fell in love with was a Tom Clancy novel. What's it like going from that to working with and writing with Tom Clancy? It was incredibly surreal for me. I didn't see it coming. I'd only had, mm -hmm. I got published in 2009. And so the very beginning of 2011, like January of 2011, I get a call from my agent and he's like, are you sitting down? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, they're, they're wondering if you'd be interested in working with Tom Clancy. And I remember thinking like, that was so far above my head. I was like, can I work with like the next guy up on the ladder, <laughs> you know, one rung above me and not mm -hmm. all the way at the top of the ladder because he was a le legend. And my yeah. dad and I would give each other the Clancy books every year for Christmas. And uh, you know, it was a big part of my life for, you know, 20 years at that point. So I, uh, more than 20 years. So yeah, so they sent me to Baltimore. I, I got to meet him and uh, we had a really nice relationship and then the next thing I knew, we I was I was working with him. The, for the first book, I wasn't allowed to tell anybody. I had to do all this research. I had to go to the Pentagon and do all these things, but I couldn't really? tell anybody I was working on a Tom Clancy book because oh, they wow. didn't they didn't know how if it was going to work out. Oh, so wow. it was very frustrating because I was like, boy, I know all these doors would open so much <laughs> quicker if I could say I'm here writing the next Jack Ryan novel. Oh yeah, you're just like I am some uh, you know new writer and yeah, uh, I'm gonna write anything. You could have you know you could have. You could have been hit me with the head of the CIA if you just said, uh, yeah, the time oh, for sure. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Me hanging out with the president and stuff and <laughs> doing whatever, golfing or whatever. The uh, So you go through that. I mean, it must have been kind of scary and intimidating a little bit to, I mean, you're working with your hero at this point. Oh, I, it was completely intimidating. I mean, it, it was so intimidating when they first offered it to me. I remember th thinking to myself, how do I get out of this? You know, without, <laughs> without making people mad at me, which is just a horrible way to think, you know, like, it's just like, I look back on that and I want to kick myself and it's like, you know, how little ambition did you have that this was like, <laughs> 
offered up to you and you're like, oh my God, I need to run for the hills. But I got over that pretty quickly. And then honestly, Tom died after we, right after we finished the third book oh, and wow. the family asked me to continue the series. And at that point, if they'd asked anybody else, I would have been very upset because I felt like mm -hmm. I was the right guy for the job. But at first it was like, whoa, this is way too big for me. Yeah. And so you took on the mantle and what an honor to be asked by the yeah, family for sure. to, to carry on his legacy. And there you go. And so you, for a while there, you were kind of switching between the gray man series, developing that and publishing those things and, and some of the Tom Clancy books. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I went back and forth and back and forth. I've, I've done almost two books a year. I've, I have a couple other series that I've started the second book and one of them's coming out later this year. And so I've written, you know, quite a few books. I was a ghostwriter too. So I wrote two books as a ghostwriter where my mm -hmm. name's not even on the book. So yeah, they, I've, I've, I've kept a pretty intense, steady pace. It took me 20 years to get published. So I guess I'm just trying to make up for lost time at this point. Make up for lost time, prove all those people wrong. Darn yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> so tell us uh, what's the, what's the basis? How did you come up with the inspiration to write this new variation or, or uh, continue it in the continuous in the series? When you're a thriller author and you write geopolitical stuff, there's mm. only so many villains you can come up with. There's China and Russia and North Korea and Iran. And then do you recycle them or do you do something different? So I'm always looking for something different. And, uh, you know, I was very interested in people like Elon Musk and, you know, these people at the forefront of artificial intelligence mm. who have, you know, their, their companies have more money than a lot of, you know, successful nations in the world. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it would be interesting to think about, to, to learn, to do research on artificial intelligence in the civilian world, because it's all sort of fueled by ego and ambition and greed. And, you know, Michael Crichton had a line in Jurassic Park talking about genetics, where he's like, everybody was so, in, you know, was asking themselves whether they could do something. <laughs> they never asked themselves whether they should they do should. something. And so now, you know, artificial intelligence tied with weapons and robotics, uh, lethal autonomous weapons, you know, it's a, it's a weapon that can, you know, decide to engage, engage and, you know, kill with no, with no human interaction. You know, that's, that makes for an easy thriller. So I, I got that idea. And then I just did a ton of research last year as I wrote the book and, uh, and learned what I needed to, to, to tell a story. There you go. I mean, there's, we've had a lot of people on, we've, we've talked about AI and uh, whether AI should be tied to weapon systems because, you know, I mean, it, it, we had a lengthy discussion about this a couple of times, but the, the issue is, is, is do you, do you tie AI to a weapon system? You know, even with the button, you know, pressing the button, you know, or what the, you know, president's got to do with the suitcase, the football to launch nuclear weapons, someone has to manually press a button. As it is now, yeah. Yeah, as it is now. But if you tie something to it that can press a button of its own free will and is its own species, like AI basically is, yeah, it's a, it's a whole new level of whether or not they should even be able to find a way to figure out how to map through a system of chips that are AI-based and press yeah. a button. So yeah, that, they're de they're definitely working on it, and uh, you know the United States has said that there will always be human and machine teams, mm -hmm. um, and there will all be a, always be a human on the loop. Yeah. But that that really doesn't matter what they say right now because the the moment China is fighting war at machine speed um, mm -hmm. and and not having to worry about humans on the loop, then we're gonna you know we're gonna be at a disadvantage, a serious disadvantage, and, and very, very quickly. There's a thing called the neuromuscular delay, which is it takes humans an instant to decide on something. Whereas, mm. uh, you know, the, these weapon systems can make thousands of calculations a second. Yeah. And an AI system isn't going to be like, I'm going to lose my wife and kids if we launch this missile. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, I, I might survive and as opposed to these silly little humans, whatever. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. And even even if we try to morally take the high road as Americans and be like, hey, we you know we need to make some smart decisions, you know, uh, evil countries, uh, the excess of evil. I feel like George Bush W. The... Uh, uh, you know, they, they don't have any scruples. Uh, right. you know, I don't think, right. I don't think, I don't think some of these guys, I mean, some of these guys care about their power and their lives, but I don't think their the value of the life of, of the people they oversee that they regard is, is of any value. Yeah. But clearly. We can clearly lose not. a few, you know, yeah. we see what Russia is doing in Ukraine and they're just feeding a, a body machine over there. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, if, if it's a race to do AI and do it right, and if they are attaching AI to their weapon systems, you know, who, who knows? So yeah. there you go. Yeah, so, ethics ethics will go out the window <laughs> at yeah. that point where we have to uh, you know fight for our survival. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just gonna be crazy. So, uh, do you want to tease out any sort of uh, AI? Was was there anything when you studied this and did your research? Was there anything kind of surprised you about AI that you can talk about that you were kind of like, oh, this this will make good data for the book. I know we can't ever talk about the middle and the end of the book, but yeah, anything I mean, you tease out. Yeah, it was all very, very fascinating and and scary. Frankly, it was, this this book scared me. And you know, let's let's look at the example of fighter pilots. Um, mm -hmm. This is the best American Air Force fighter F sixteen pilot went up in a simulator against the most advanced artificial intelligence that could fly planes and do air to air combat. And the human never got a shot off. Lost fifteen to zero. The to zero, yeah. The, uh, the simulated AI aircraft wow. was taking things called front quarter shots, which is a head on shot, which a human doesn't even try. Yeah. And they were so aggressive. The, the pilot, and this has happened more than once, the pilots say that it's complete 100% aggression all the time, and there's no time for the, the human to think or react. So oh, that's kind of scary. And artificial intelligence models have also created novel toxins for, for chemical weapons, things that <laughs> things that humans haven't discovered yet, and, uh, you know, and, you know, have come up with this synthesized stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, they're large language models. They're not actually operational. They're not actually yeah. making these things. But in the book, I talk about how these really sophisticated large language model models, if you had, if you hook it up with an offshore bank account and you set it on a mission, it can socially engineer people. It can get people to do its bidding. It can pay people. It can threaten people. It can, you know, have people kill people. And so, you know, where this is going, I don't really know, but you know, there's a lot to think about when you read the book. Holy crap. That is scary. You know, we've had some top Air Force pilots have fought in Iraq and have written books on the show. And, you know, reading their books, you know, there's there's a certain element of being in a dogfight and stuff and being in mil and you know, the military in a military conflict, I suppose, of any nature, that there there comes a point where self preservation is gonna is going to be a, a timing effect, right? Sure, sure. Where, you know, you're talking about, you know, it's aggression all the time. But AI is not sitting around going, I might not see my wife and kids. Exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's whole it's whole substack, if you will, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word, is 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 a paradigm on winning and it not self preservation in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't care yeah. Yeah. at all. And so that's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're complete. They're completely remorseless, and uh, you know, they're they're people think you know is is the artificial intelligence going to be like a human? The human brain is still the most powerful processor on Earth, but mm. artificial intelligence, you know, built the right way, there it's able to train itself. So it's mm -hmm. able to train itself on things that we don't even think to teach it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, this is something that even even the people in charge of the the different AI companies are. Have, have said that they're a little bit afraid of what, what they have behind. The gatekeepers are afraid of what's behind the gate, is, is yeah. the way to put it. Total Terminator aggression. Yeah. You know, it, like even in some of the books, they have to talk about making decisions of whether to bail out or not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're watching gas, you're, you know, uh, I'm flying a $2 billion machine. If I, if I, if I'm sloppy and wreck this in the ground, I'm probably going to bill for it. I don't know. Yeah. You know, you, you think about so many different things and, and, and the timing effect, even though, you know, I, like a lot of these guys that are air force dudes, they have to think in like, they have to process a lot of data in milliseconds and make yeah. decisions in milliseconds that are life and death for them. And maybe uh, troops they're defending on the ground and it, it just, that just boggles the mind to think about. It when you go yeah. On. They, they call it task saturation where you just have so much to do yeah. and artificial intelligence doesn't have to worry about it. Another thing it doesn't have to worry about are G forces <laughs> um, yeah, the, the way true. that a, the way that a human being does. I I've been Holy in a fighter shit. plane and I've, I've done six and a half G's and uh, which isn't even a ton of G's, but it was plenty for me. Yeah. It's a lot more, it's a lot more than I'd ever had before. Oh and, yeah. Uh, and you know, they, these, they can go right up to the limits of the of the aircraft itself and they don't there's not this uh, you know bag of blood and bones inside the plane that they, wow. it has to keep alive that is crazy i didn't think about that too because there's a whole process they have to go with their breathing and different techniques mm -hmm. they use not to pass out and yeah. to move their blood flow around and yeah i mean that that ai can 
calculate down to i don't know the the ultra limits of the mathematical microsecond of micro g-force and turn that plane around and yeah. be right up your butt with the uh, bullets yeah. uh, there you go was there any challenges you ran into writing this book you know, I, I didn't want to make it too techie. It's it's like real important that people understand this is not science fiction. Everything that I put in the book was either existing or emerging technology. I might mm -hmm. have utilized it in ways that it isn't being used in the world, but you mm -hmm. know, it's you can go on Google any any of the robots that you see in the book, and there's a lot of it's, it's a book about human beings, but but there are this the novel thing is there are these killer robots. Every single thing that is in the book, you can find some version of online, you know, videos of robot dogs with 6.5 Creedmoor rifles on their backs or, you know, big hexacopter drones that drop robot dogs with, with rifles on their backs, you know, yeah. off as a payload and, uh, you know, very, very, very agile bipedal uh, robots that, you know, look remarkably and act remarkably like humans. And it's all, it's all existing or, or newly emerging technology. That is crazy, man. Yeah. And so you're going to get the latest technology, folks. Pick up the book and find out. Uh, hopefully we survive. And I imagine the uh, our, our protagonist, our, our uh, gray man character, is going to be the guy who saves the world with humanity. Damn it. <laughs> Not AI. Or maybe it, he's going to try. He's going to try. <laughs> there you go. You got to read the book to find out if he makes it or not. Find out if he survives as a species. There you go. So how do you see the gray man evolving over time with each book? How to keep the stories fresh and engaging? You know, that's the toughest part at this stage of the game is to not go back over ground that you've already covered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the psychology of the character is really interesting for me because I've created this guy who's an assassin, but he has a moral compass. Mm -hmm. He's very, very paranoid for lots and lots of good reasons, but he's in love with somebody. So he's had to let, uh -huh. let his guard down. You know, so there's all these sort of like dichotomies that have just come along in the series. And I try to sort of explore all of them. So the psychology of the character is probably the, the most interesting thing for me. I want to make, mm -hmm. make his actions true to the person that I've built up all over all these years. So that makes it a lot of fun. But the, you know, as far as how do you, you know, come up with something fresh, it's I have to go out and get new information because I've used up all of my cool ideas long ago. <laughs> now it's all about, you know, finding the next new thing. So that's why I fly in planes or or scuba dive or travel to West Africa, like I did a couple months ago. You know, oh, the, you, you just go out there and do what you need to do to uh, to get new information in your brain so you're not writing the same book every year. Yeah, it sounds like you're staying up on the technology basis that the military is also pursuing. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me to watch. I was watching a video just earlier on TikTok of, you know, how basically Ukraine is I, I don't know if we can say they're winning the war at this point, but they, you know they they're basically they've one of the things they've used is these little drones. Mm -hmm. and you see these drones just dropping a hand grenade basically yeah. into a tank, yeah. And the way the Russian tanks are made with the with the with the uh, military armor or the ammunition being at the bottom of the tank and giving that what do they call it the pop thing effect mm -hmm. is just extraordinary to watch. And they just yeah. fly you know they just fly up to these Russians that are in in a foxhole or whatever, digging or hiding under the ground. And they just drop, they just drop a grenade in there. And yeah. Just, the, Russians have surrendered to drones before and the, and the drones lead them back to, <laughs> uh, to, to Ukrainian lines. So the, the drones are, they're about $400. Most of them yeah. come out of China, I think. Yeah. And, it's in the military, they call it a tritable. In other words, you can, you can bear to lose a bunch of them. And, you know, yeah. a lot of them get shot down. A lot of them, you know, are not successful. A lot of them, you know, go out and never come back, but they're cheap enough and they're it plentiful doesn't... enough that, that it's okay. You know, you can, yeah. you can send 2000 out and do a lot of damage. And if 500 come back, you'll send 2000 out tomorrow. And you can't do that with fighter planes or human beings. Hopefully yeah. the yeah. Russians do, but the rest of us don't. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at how I mean, these are multi-million dollar tanks by Absolutely. Russia. Yeah. They're not easy replaceable. Yeah. And you see how that has how that's got to change the face of war yeah. in, in the future and stuff. I know there's a drone on the cover of the new book. That's why I brought it up. Is there yeah. any application to that or anything? You oh, yeah. There, there's a lot. There's there's reconnaissance drones and mm -hmm. then there's, you know, operational, you know, military drones in there. And they're all based on mm -hmm. real things out there. The interesting thing about drones is a, a, 
it is possible to hack them or to jam their signal. Yeah. So there's a lot of advances in putting all the artificial intelligence on the drone. So you can't, there's no signal to it. If it's going out and it's looking for a target on its own with no human input and it's discriminating against targets and then it's identifying a target and then it's killing the target that can all be done on board in, in, in the brain of these little drones. And that's, yeah. that's where things are going. It's crazy. In fact, I guess Ukraine was one of the first to develop them. Ironically, these drone jammer guns, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen them. Yeah. These giant looking things and yeah. evidently they can, you know, someone's coming at you with a drone, but yeah, it's changing the face of warfare and how it goes. Is there any favorite scene or chapter in chaos agent uh, without giving too much away? You can tease out maybe. Yeah. It's, it's hard to, to go too deep in this without giving too much away, but yeah. it, it, it's uh, the scene where the hero and his girlfriend Zoya realize what they're up against. They don't know that they're up against robots and they, they're up against artificial intelligence. Um, sort of that scene, and it takes place in Mexico on the, on the, the coast in Quintana Roo in Tulum. And uh, they're at a house and there's this moment where they're, they're battling humans. And then suddenly something else moves into their, uh, you know, into their viewpoint. And so that, that was an interesting th thing to write. And then they immediately have to sort of retool their, their fighting style to figure out how to remain invisible and, and, uh, you know, and battle this thing, which they, you know, realize is, is tougher than any human they're coming up against. There you go. You'll have to order the book folks to find out what happens next. Anything new on the horizon? Are you working on the 14th book in the series or what's up for you? I will work on the 14th book this year and it will be out this time next year. But right now I'm doing some final edits on a book that's coming out June 25th. It's the second mm -hmm. novel in my Josh Duffy series. The first oh, one was called Armored and it came out a couple years ago. So this one's called Sentinel. It comes out in June and it's being developed for TV. Hopefully something will come, come out of that. And uh, yeah, that, that's my next book. And then I'll, I, as soon as I'm done promoting this book and finishing my edits on that one, I'll go mm -hmm. into Gray Man 14. There you go. People can pre-order Sentinel June 24th or 25th, 2024. Yeah. Yeah. I've got my 24s and 5ths mixed up there. <laughs> Dyslexic probably. I don't know. But yeah, that you can pre-order both books since the other one's uh, 10 days out. So there you go. Mark, please come back for that one. We'd love to have you back. Oh, I'll please come back. back for all of them where you're always welcome. And uh, yeah, give us your dot coms and final plugs wherever you want, you want people to find you on the interwebs. Yeah, it's markgrainybooks.com or uh, author Mark Grainy on Facebook, or I think it's, it's Mark Grainy Books on Instagram, and it's Mark Grainy Book without the S on Twitter. <laughs> I think that's all of them. There you go. Thanks for coming on, Mark. We really appreciate it. Great to see you again, Chris. There you go. Great to see you again as well. Order up the book, folks. Wherever fine books are sold, out February 20th, a week from now, 2024, The Chaos Agent, book 13 of 13 in the Gray Man series. Just go on there and order them all. Put them all on your credit card and give them away to friends and neighbors and relatives, uh, and uh, you can share in the reading and all that good stuff. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, for Chess Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, for Chess Chris Foss, Chris Foss, one of the TikTokity, and all those crazy places on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.